In my last video, I showed you the scene from Game of Thrones where Drogo gives Viceroy a bad hair day by giving him a golden crown, and that this was one of the most inefficient and expensive ways to kill someone ever, with just gold alone needed to do this, costing some $3 million or so. And most of that gold would have just run off his head, as was demonstrated by pouring molten gold on a potato. But that's peanuts compared to just how expensive it would be to shoot someone with an antimatter bullet. Now, sure, normally just being shot alone would be traumatic enough. Ow! You shot me, you a hole! But believe me, just getting shot with an antimatter bullet would take it to a whole new level. Plus, it would be one of the most expensive deaths ever. Now, currently, we can only make very small quantities of antihydrogen which has been estimated to cost about $60 trillion per gram. And just to put that into perspective, the entire GDP of America is currently about $20 trillion. So it would take the entire GDP of America for about three years just to get one gram of anti-hydrogen. Plus, you don't just need one gram. Even smallish bullets are about 10 grams. So you'd be looking at something like the entire GDP of the US for 30 years. And we're still nowhere near getting our bullet because you don't need anti-hydrogen to make your bullet. You need anti-iron, which currently can't be done, but would probably add somewhere between one and three zeros to the price. I mean, you're probably in the region of the entire lifetime GDP of America and probably the world to simply make an anti-iron bullet. So why is antimatter so expensive? Well, it reacts with matter to create a lot of energy. And what makes matters worse? This is a barrierless process. You see, matter and antimatter have opposite charges. So let's just say, take for instance, a hydrogen atom, which is a proton, which is positively charged, that's the nucleus, and an electron, which is negatively charged. And they're sort of held together by electrostatics. And the whole unit overall is neutral. Antihydrogen consists of an antiproton, which is negatively charged, and an electron, which is positively charged, a positron. So again, the whole atom is overall neutral. So there's no real attraction between atoms of matter and antimatter. But there's no real repulsion either. So when they first touch, the proton and the antiproton annihilate, releasing some energy. And then you're left with a proton and an antiproton with opposite charges, and they electrostatically attract each other very strongly until they too annihilate, releasing a crazy amount of energy. And that's why handling antimatter is so tricky. And this is why the biggest atom ever made is antihydrogen. And the biggest nucleus ever created is antihelium. And that's because nuclei are positively charged, whereas atoms are neutral. So you can actually hold a charged nucleus in an electric field in a vacuum without it touching anything. Something that you just can't do with neutral atoms. So as you can imagine, making anti-iron is probably impossible. I mean, just for where we are at the moment, it's considered a big step forward and bragging rights for the group that manages to do it when they make 18 nuclei of anti-helium. <laughs> yeah, we're not getting anti-iron anytime soon, let alone grams of it. But let's just ignore the minor technical details for the moment and just say that you could make grams of anti-iron. Its properties would be exactly the same as regular iron in that you can make bullets out of it. So let's just say you managed to fire a bullet for the moment, which we'll come back to because that's actually quite tricky in itself. When that bullet hits you, what happens? Well, almost immediately the bullet comes into contact with your skin, the matter and the antimatter start to annihilate. So let's just say the bullet's merely touched the skin and has annihilated about 1 30th of the mass of the bullet, one third of a gram. That's still just released about as much energy as the Hiroshima nuke. Yep, the 20 kilotons of the Hiroshima bomb was equal to about a third to half a gram of matter annihilation, merely about the size of an aspirin tablet. And that's when it's just barely nicked the skin. So how does that energy come out? Well, it turns out it's actually very similar to nukes like this in that loads of that energy comes out in the form of high energy photons, gamma rays. 
See, most folks wouldn't know this, but this is basically how nukes work as well, is that when you get this huge amount of energy released in a nuke, it gives off loads of high-energy photons, which heat up the air around it to a very high temperature very quickly, in less than a millisecond. And then it's just the expansion of that very hot gas ball, which gives you the blast. Yep, nuclear weapons are basically blast weapons. Air pressure is what does the destroying. Sure, it's interesting to go through this sometimes frame by frame, where you can actually see the flash of the fireball, and if you were exposed to this, yeah, you would be very badly burned. But compared to what happens when a blast wave like this hits the house, eh, there's not really much comparison. The forward part of the roof is snapped upward like a lid, crashing into the rear yard. Now the blast wave gets inside and the house under tremendous pressure, blows apart. Within minutes after the blast, our troops move into no man's land as part of their own test exercise. Now generally, as a pretty decent rule of thumb, the ability of a material to absorb those X-rays or gamma rays is related to the number of charged particles in it, which is basically proportional to the number of electrons in the material, which is basically proportional to the density of the material. So, ballpark numbers, air is about one milligram per cubic centimeter, while humans are basically water, which is about one gram per cubic centimeter, and iron is about 10 grams per cubic centimeter. So about as many x-rays will be absorbed by that first centimeter of the bullet as the next 100 meters of air. Now at this point, there might be people out there saying, yeah, you're talking a lot about gamma rays coming out of high energy nukes and that sort of thing. But why should I believe you? You're just some random guy on the internet. I want to see proof. Well, actually, it turns out that if you look at some of the early test footage of nuclear weapons, you can see exactly this effect. In that, have you ever wondered what those spikes are coming out the bottom of this nuclear explosion? Well, it turns out what's actually happening there is there was a tower holding up the nukes, and that was kept stable by iron cables. So when the bomb goes off and gives off this really intense pulse of gamma and x-rays coming out of the explosion at the speed of light, and of course those x-rays and gamma rays are disproportionately absorbed by the most dense material around, which in this case is the iron of the cables, which then gets so hot that it actually vaporizes and gives these spikes. And because that gamma ray pulse came out at the speed of light, that's why the spikes come out ahead of the main blast wave. The bottom line is, almost immediately that bullet hits you. That bullet will be vaporized by the gamma ray flux alone. And of course, once all those antimatter atoms are scattered, they react with the matter in the air. It also means that whatever human gets hit here is going to have the mother of all bad hair days. And just say, for instance, humans are about a meter thick or something, that means that you're going to receive about as much heating from the gamma ray flux as the next thousand meters of air. So, in reality, the bullet will have probably barely broken the skin before the victim evaporates into a whiff of hydrogen, ozone, and carbon monoxide. And, and what will result is a blast equivalent of about 50 Hiroshima-style nukes. Now, that's not actually that big. I mean, sure, it's not going to be something you walk away from, but it's only the equivalent of about a half megaton nuke. The Castle Bravo test was meant to have a yield of five megatons, which is about 10 times the size of the blast that you would get from being shot with an antimatter bullet. Unfortunately, with Castle Bravo, someone made a miscalculation, and rather than it being a five megaton yield, it turned out to be a 15 megaton yield. Scientists monitoring the test quickly realized that something was wrong. The lithium-7 hadn't been inert. The explosion wasn't 6 megatons, but 15, 250% of the expected size. But I've got good news for you, because your would-be assassin is also going to get what's coming to him, in that that bullet would never get to pierce your skin. Because let's just say the shooter was merely one meter away. That means that as the bullet's going through the air, 
it will actually be annihilating the antimatter of the bullet with the regular matter of the air, which means you will have released a comparable amount of energy to the Hiroshima nuke merely by the time the bullet has reached you. But hey, I've got even better news than that, because the way the bullets work is you set off a charge, which is typically a few hundred milligrams of a sort of big explosive of some sort or another, which creates expanding gases that pushes the bullet out. But of course, that's regular matter pushing on an antimatter bullet. So merely shooting the gun would cause the annihilation of all the antimatter of the bullet, resulting in a half megaton type nuclear explosion in the hand of your would-be assassin. And sure, that's ignoring the problem of how you would load an antimatter bullet into a regular matter gun, which, it's got to be said, is probably quite tricky. Nonetheless, you could take some minor consolation in the fact that your would-be assassin will evaporate into a whiff of hydrogen, ozone, and carbon monoxide a few milliseconds before you do. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And of course, remember, if you really like this channel, subscribing is no longer enough to ensure that my videos will turn up in your feed. If you want to do that, you've got to hit the little notification bell. And of course, if you really like this stuff and want to support this channel directly, you can do it through Patreon. And I'll leave the links below.